Um, Dr. Meltzer is University Lecturer in Arabic and Islam at the Oriental Institute, and he's also a fellow at the Pembroke College of uh, Oxford. Um, he's one of the leading experts on Islamic law, focusing on the formation of Islamic legal traditions and on the early Hanbali school. Um, in, right after the lecture, there'll be a reception. We hope that you'll join us right outside here in the atrium. There will be some food and drink. Um, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Melcher. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction. Thank you to organizers, uh, John Bodnar. The, are you Bodnar? No? He's out of town. Out of town, okay. Well, in absentia, I thank him. In absentia also, I understand from illness, uh, Kevin Jakes of Islamic Studies and Religious <coughs> Studies, and Avona Head, at least she's here, I can think. Uh, my topic is the shaping of Islam in the Middle Ages, especially Sunnism. Uh, in some ways, this is a precy of the dissertation I once set out to write, probably not my next book, but the next book after that. Uh, I conceived of Sunnism as a series of agreements to disagree uh, in Quran, Hadith, law, and piety. Uh, in fact, the law chapter expanded to be the whole of the dissertation, but uh, my work has been uh, on this theme, if nothing else, ever since. So to begin with the Quran, uh, it's a good example of an agreement to disagree, since we have not one text that is officially recognized, but uh, seven or ten. Uh, in the area of the Quran, my chief topic of investigation has been Quranic scholarship. Uh, now, texts, of course, were necessarily somewhat fluid in the manuscript age. Uh, you, it's very difficult to copy something by hand and not make a few mistakes. You know, one or two percent of every manuscript you can expect to be off. Uh, now, in Islamic dogma, the Quran is the word of God dictated to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. The late Muhammad Arkun of Paris proposed that we distinguish between the Quran and the mind of God. Uh, the Quran as the angel received it, the Quran as the angel dictated it to Muhammad, and he heard it. And then the Quran as the com companions heard it from the prophet. Now, Arkun wanted room for interpretive maneuver, but the idea that the Quran in our hands is only an approximation of the Quran in the mind of God is actually fairly traditional. Uh, one angle on this is the difficulty of getting at God's intention. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes we're certain about what God meant, sometimes uh, not certain. Uh, more on this when I get especially to law. But my own scholarship on the Quran is concerned mainly uncertainty about the precise text of the Quran. Okay, what am I talking about? The text of the Quran is actually quite uniform. Uh, there's much less variant among Quranic manuscripts than there is among New Testament manuscripts, for example. Uh, the f still, there are disagreements. Uh, for example, the first chapter of the Quran is recited more than any other chapter. You know, it's absolutely required in every one of the five daily prayers. Near the beginning, it invokes Malik Yom Adin in the most commonly <coughs> recited version, but also Malik Yom Adin in another version that's uh, much used in especially North Africa. Uh, it either means possessor of the day of judgment or it means king of the day of judgment. It's a fairly typical disagreement. It turns on whether or not to read an aleph in the uh, beginning word of that line. Uh, it doesn't make any big difference to the meaning, and none of these variants in the text of the Quran make a big difference in the meaning. Still, it's not, uh, it's not one text. <coughs> so in the 9th and 10th centuries, various Quran experts published books discussing different texts <coughs> and favoring the versions of uh, various readers, mostly of the 8th century CE. When I first approached the problem of the text of the Quran, I was drawn to Menit in Mujahid, I think he's on your handouts. He's famous for establishing seven accepted uh, textual variants or readings of the Quran, Qur'at in Arabic. I thought this was probably a paradigmatic example of a Sunni agreement to disagree. Not one text, but uh, several. Two Quran readers were famously tried for reciting uh, unacceptable variants, Ibn Miqsum in uh, 934 CE and Ibn Shandabu the next year. They were both forced to recant. And both of these trials have been presented as triumphs of the traditionalist party, the one that wanted law and 
uh, theology to be based as far as possible on texts, on revelation, and not on speculation. Uh, well, my investigation showed that actually, true, Ibn Mujahid did bring some forms of Hadith science to a study of the Quran. But personally, he was much closer to a theological party that was in the middle, to a legal party that was in the middle, that was trying to use revelation and reason. <coughs> And moreover, it transpired that the study and transmission of the Quranic readings before Ibn Mujahid had been mostly ca carried out by grammarians and literateurs, not by Hadith people. And I discovered other mistakes in the standard account. Uh, it has been alleged repeatedly that he connects his, in Mujahid here, that he connects his seven readings with the seven ahruf of a famous Hadith report in which the Prophet says the Quran was revealed in seven variants. Ahruf is the word of the Hadith report. Kera'at is the word commonly used for what Ibn Mujahid identified. Well, actually, Ibn Mujahid never does say that his Kera'at have some relation to these seven Ahruf. Uh, his seven were popularized by disciples, most notably someone named Ibn Khalaway. But other books of the same century advocated other numbers of accepted readings. I mean, Tabari, just a few years before him, had published a book advocating 20 readings. Uh, in general, they say Iraq and points east tended to favor 10 readings, and Syria and points west tended to favor seven readings. Uh, years later, I counted titles in a 17th century uh, bibliography. It's Katib Chalabi's Keshva Zanun. Uh, this was <coughs> book put together by an uh, Ottoman scholar. It's a list of all the Arabic books that he knew about. Practically, it's all the things that were in manuscript at that time in Istanbul. A lot of these books are lost, but you can sort of guess from the titles what they were about. In fact, 155 books seem to have to do with some identifiable number of Quranic readings. Uh, and I've got some figures in your handout. 73 of the 155, a, few, a bit fewer than half, uh, have to do with seven readings. 43, a little more than a quarter, have to do with 10 readings. Seven books treat eight. Uh, the remaining 32 treat other numbers of readings, of which just one is about the whole 14. Now, plainly, the Hadith report about the seven Ahruf did not constrain the selection of how many readings that scholars were interested in or thought acceptable. Later still, I investigated how the different readings are related to one another. It seemed that there was usually no correlation among the readings from the same city, negligible between readings and the alleged teachers of the associated readers. I mean, you might have two guys who studied under uh, this same teacher and somebody else here who did not study under him had other teachers. You couldn't say these two are therefore going to agree much more often than this guy. Uh, there was no correlation at all between teachers and readings. Uh, there is impressive agreement among the readings at the level of the Continental Outline, the Rasm in Arabic. Uh, okay, Arabic is written, you've got the consonants, and then some other consonants are the same, so you distinguish them by dots above and below the line. One dot or two dots. Hebrew is... Mm, <coughs> leave out Hebrew. Uh, if you take away all the dots, if you take away all the vowel signs, then all the seven readings, all the 10 readings, all the 14 readings agree almost always. So there's a story that uh, the present text of the Quran we owe to a very early caliph sending out copies of an authoritative official collection, telling people to burn every other copy. Something like this had to have happened to get this level of agreement over the continental outline. But plainly, there was no official version of how the vowels should be and no official version of where the dots should go. So what are the disagreements? I have also a table, I think, on your handout. Uh, vowels to supply, not conceivably dialectal, 31%. For example, la tas'al as opposed to la tus'al. This is a matter of the vowel you supply, it's either active verb or passive verb. Vowels to supply, conceivably dialectal, 24%. My sara as opposed to my sura. Uh, I mentioned this issue of dialects because it's popular among modern Muslims to say that the differences among the readings ha go back to different dialects. And I say, no, that's uh, not supported by the evidence. 
uh, whether to supply dots above or below the line. Uh, for example, naghfir lakum, khatayakum, and yughfar lakum, and tughfar. Well, this is a matter of whether you put two dots below the line, two dots above the line, or one dot above the line. Uh, whether to pronounce final ya, yeah, whether to supply an alif, um, other sources of dispute, whether to supply a hamza. Well, it turns out that the dif disagreements among these different readings of the Quran have to do with interpreting an unvoweled, undotted outline. They do not have to do with dialectal differences, and this is confirmed actually by literature about the readings. We have books that explain, uh, that justify the different readings. <clears throat> they will say, well, this reading implies such and such, this other reading implies such and such. You know, this reading makes the verb active, this reading makes the verb passive, things like that. They do not appeal to transmission history, and they very seldom appeal to uh, dialects. <coughs> uh, uh, Sunni writers in the Middle Ages were comfortable with the combination of revelation and reason. <coughs> I mean, the revelation is uh, well, what's revealed. <coughs> the revelation is the way that the angel dictated the Quran to Muhammad. Uh, what we, the continental outline we have, is a reliable record of. <coughs> what the angel dictated. But we don't know for sure details about uh, certain vowels and certain consonants. Uh, so by reason, we reconstruct what the text was. And there are naturally differences. And we put up with those differences because uh, none of us can be certain that his own version is the correct one. OK, an important question to me is why this all happened when it did in the early 10th century. Uh, I'd say it's partly a matter of accumulation, as in our time. I mean, why did it take till 2007 for somebody to tabulate the sources of disagreement? Well, there aren't that many people working on the Quran, and it took a while for somebody to get around to it. In the same way, uh, there probably had to be a certain amount of Quranic scholarship before somebody could say, OK, let's synthesize this and put a little order in our house. Uh, the force of example in other fields is significant. By the later 10th century, when Ibn Mujahid's seven became generally recognized, certain hadith collections were beginning to be recognized as weightier than others. It seems natural that they should think, well, certain readings of the Quran also should be, from now on, considered more weighty than others. Uh, by the later 10th century, it was becoming difficult to offer opinions in law without adhering to one of the recognized schools. So again, this move to regularize things and draw lines. And then for anything that happened in that century, we can always say it was in some measure a matter of the Sunni community drawing together, consolidating itself against the Shi community. OK, hadith is second area of investigation. Uh, hadith means, uh, let's say basically, reports of what the prophet said and did. Uh, we have thousands of these reports. You know, um, be an example. Um, uh, so and so told me. So and so told me. So and so had it from. So and so had it from. So and so had it from. So and so who said that the, the prophet said, "Cursed be anybody who eats standing up." Uh, so from this is inferred the rule that it's better to eat sitting down, uh, which actually, if you think about it, uh, does conduce to uh, dignity, I think. Uh, OK, uh, Islamic law, of which this is an example, because Islamic law covers things that are recommended as well as things that are required is based effectively on two revealed sources, Quran and Hadith. Uh, the Quran was dictated from God. Hadith tells us what the prophet said and did under the inspiration of God. S uh, actually, it took some time for the inspiration of the prophet to become dogma Shafi'i, who lived in the early 9th century. Uh, apparently, he has to argue strenuously that Hadith is equally inspired with the Quran. <coughs> 
but he was arguing especially against Mu'tazila, who wanted to base the law on the Quran to, to the exclusion of Hadith. They said, let's use the Quran and reason to figure out the law. Uh, hadith is too dodgy, we can't rely on it. But uh, Chef, he said, no, it's not dodgy. We have measure, we have ways of telling what's good and what's bad. And it's really, uh, it's what God told the prophet to do. So it's really just as good epistemologically as the Quran itself. Uh, I'll have more to say on this uh, dispute later. But for now, Hadith is another good example of how the Sunnis made peace with disagreement and uncertainty. Now, one major advance in modern Hadith scholarship, for which I do not take credit, is Eric Dickinson's identification of the basic method of Hadith criticism in a comparison of Asanid. I'll be talking more about this tomorrow in a smaller group. Uh, there are many Hadith in circulation, often contradictory. Uh, the anomaly, the version that disagreed with the rest, would be discarded. Uh, probably if they didn't, they didn't offer, s they didn't apply such strict tests when it came to uh, rejected theologies. I mean, would the Prophet have said, uh, if you ever see Muawiyah on this minbar, kill him? Uh, widespread hadith, obviously Shi'i in origin, and Sunnis don't bother to go over the Asnad to find out who, where the weak link is. They say anybody who related this hadith is necessarily to be distrusted. Uh, uh, but on the whole, a reliable traditionist was someone who was continually associated with hadith reports that were corroborated by parallel versions. Whereas uh, the unreliable traditionist was the one continually associated with uncorroborated versions. Now, contrary to numerous modern descriptions of Hadith criticism, biographical data were fairly unimportant. Indeed, biographical data were likely to be inferred from Hadith rather than uh, the other way around, uh, rather than forming the basis of Hadith criticism. We have lots and lots of biographical dictionaries. We have lots of entries that tell us about traditionists, people who related Hadith, and they will include ratings. This guy was trustworthy, this guy was uh, okay, this guy was uh, weak, this guy was weak-minded, this guy stole hadith, this guy was a great liar, things like this. But uh, these data are not independent of the hadith. Rather, they would s find out that somebody is associated with a whole lot of weak hadith, and from that they would conclude that he was a weak or a, a liar or something else. Uh, Dickinson points, for example, to the figure of Ibn Lahia who was an Egyptian authority in the late, uh, late 700s. Uh, there are reports that he became unreliable after he lost his notebooks to a fire. Once he lost his notebooks, he can't refresh his memory, and he's going to start relating things that he didn't really hear. Or else there was a flood, and he lost his notebooks that way. Or uh, he became senile, or he suffered a stroke. Or alternatively, he was simply careless, or he was not careless, but uh, some of his students were careless. Well, altogether, it seems plain that traditionists didn't have data actually about his life. What they knew was that sometimes he was with, associated with Hadith that they liked, and sometimes he was associated with Hadith they didn't like. And so they generated all these stories speculatively to explain why some of his Hadith were okay and some were not okay. Uh, my own first article on Hadith scholarship was inspired, first of all, by doubts uh, raised by Norbin Calder concerning one biographical dictionary. But uh, my study of it actually mainly confirmed Dickinson's emphasis on Isnat comparison, comparing the different Hadith reports to find out what was genuine, what was not. Okay, to go a little beyond what Dickinson says, uh, summaries of Hadith criticism are commonly organized biographically, as I said. Uh, Bukhari is the greatest, most prestigious Sunni collector, also is associated with the biographical dictionary. You know, it's, it, it's big, uh, nine volumes in the printed edition. Uh, I guess it's because of the biographical organization that many modern students, most modern students, have stressed biographical information when they're talking about how Hadith criticism worked. 
but I guess that there's continual disagreement. One person will say trustworthy, somebody else will say basically okay. Somebody else might even say weak of the same transmitter, not because they had different information in front of them, but because each one is going by his own feel for how to read the evidence of Hadith they're comparing. Uh, and when you're comparing intuitions, well, each guy is aware that he works largely on intuition, so he's not going to be that hard on other people who disagree with him. Ahmed ibn Hanbal is not going to say, yeah, the means no good because he had disagrees with me a quarter of the time. Uh, he's going to say, well, he has his opinion, I have mine. Uh, we find the hadith that Sunnis accept, above all, in what are called the six books. Uh, two of them have paramount prestige, those of Bukhari and Muslim. Someone named Jonathan Brown has described how they gradually rose to preeminence. Now, Brown's explanation for their attraction is that it mitigated evident disunity from the multiple schools of law. There were four schools of law, but at least everybody could agree on respecting Bukhari and Muslim. This is Dickinson's theory. Actually, though, if you look at law books from the High Middle Ages, it's evident that Bukhari and Muslim's collections, uh, being in these collections, was not enough to show that a particular Hadith report was reliable, reliable enough to establish a rule. And they bring in lots of Hadith that aren't in Bukhari or Muslim, or any of the six books, actually. Uh, what I, in my own scholarship, have especially tried to push is recognition that the significance of hadith changes across the ninth century. Uh, for Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who lived in the first half of the century, hadith practically defined the law. Uh, if you asked him a question, he would uh, very likely answer you by saying, well, the hadith report says, kada wa kada. Uh, if, he's, if there's conflicting hadith reports, he would try to resolve the question by seeing which one is good. He would say, well, X says this, Y says this, uh, but Y is no good because, and then I'll give you a reason. That's why I go by X. Uh, what are some conflicting Hadith reports? Uh, uh, still in the field of etiquette, I remember uh, we have several Hadith reports that say as long as you're at prayer and as long as you're in the mosque, you're at prayer, you shouldn't intermesh your uh, fingers because, uh, well, anyway, you shouldn't intermesh your fingers. On the other hand, we have other hadith that say uh, the prophet put his fingers together and said the believers are like a wall. They reinforce one another. So was the prophet happy to intermesh his fingers or wasn't he? Well, Ahmed ibn Hanbal would say, you got these two hadith reports. He would look for the the transmission history of each one, and by comparing them, decide uh, which was stronger and go by that. Sometimes uh, he actually leaves it up to his listener. He'll say, well, there's Hadith over this side, there's Hadith on this side. You know, he didn't want to choose between them. Take your pick. Uh, but in the later ninth century, uh, even the followers of Ahmed ibn Hamba would not just say, well, the Hadith says this or that. People who are specialized in Hadith, people who collect Hadith, refer to themselves as auxiliaries to the people who study the law. Uh, so, uh, so they're, they're pushing things in the legal direction where things, where there's expressed disagreement and disagreement goes back to different interpretation of the evidence, and the different uh, schools, as they're crystallizing, uh, recognize each other as mutual, as uh, legitimate. Okay, in short, the body of significant Hadith is very large with uncertain boundaries. Putting up with these uncertain boundaries is another Sunni agreement to disagree. It's based on a recognition that Hadith is still a combination of revelation, which is what the Prophet said and did, and reason, which is how people have reconstructed what the Prophet said it did, and how people have figured out the true reports of what the Prophet did from the false reports of what the Prophet did. Uh, distinguishing reliable hadith from unreliable was normally a matter of probability, not certainty. Uh, 
and another scholar's different estimate of probability was to be respected. Okay, law. Uh, law became the subject of my dissertation in the first book. Uh, this is perhaps the greatest example of agreeing to disagree, uh, namely the formation of four mutually legitimate uh, uh, recognized schools of law. Uh, not one school, but four. Following my teacher, George Mactasy, in stressing the formation of jurisprudence, the certification of jurisprudence, I found that whereas in the 8th and 9th centuries, jurisprudence normally had multiple teachers, when it's in Hadith, you would collect Hadith from uh, many persons. Uh, so in the 10th century, uh, no, not any longer, uh, multiple teachers. From the 10th century, you get clear identif clearly identified teachers and students in the field of law. So-and-so learned his law from so-and-so. Uh, I also discovered that there tended to be, from the 10th century, a regular curriculum one would study a short compilation of the law and write a commentary on it as a sort of doctoral dissertation. Uh, dating these de developments made it appear that the Shafi school actually appeared first uh, in Baghdad near the beginning of the 10th century, a generation the, later the Hanafi school, a generation later the Maliki school, and about a generation of that in the early 11th century, the Hanbali school. Uh, these schools are named after people who lived much earlier, and they did not die in that order, but uh, this is roughly the order, I think, in which the schools formed. Uh, other students since then have proposed uh, 1,000 as a turning point. Oh, some before. F yeah, they have a point. From this point forward, uh, jurisprudence no longer argued for the correctness of peculiar rules of their schools, rather for their plausibility. That's right. Uh, one explanation advanced for this is that they were persuaded by the literature of usul al-fiqh. Uh, usul al-fiqh is the literature of the theory of the law. You've got usul and furu'a. Usul is books usually shorter that explain theory. Furu'a is books that may be very large that give you all the rules and uh, justify the rules. Uh, the idea of in usul al-fiqh, it's true, is that God knows what he wants us to do, but he hasn't always chosen to give us enough evidence to be sure. So some things are known with certainty. Uh, the Quran is the word of God. Muhammad is the final messenger. Five prayers are required every day. Denying these things is a serious offense. In fact, it amounts to unbelief. It's not permissible for a Muslim to doubt these things. But most matters of the law are subject to disagreement uh, among the experts because the evidence that God has chosen to give us is ambiguous. Uh, most often, d different investigators apparently think that different Hadith reports are the most likely to tell us the gist of what the Prophet said. For example, everyone agrees that the ritual prayer begins with raising the hands and saying, Allahu Akbar. But there's disagreement over how far you raise your hands. Is it up to the shoulders? Is that enough? Does it have to be up to the sides of your head? Does it actually touch your ears? Each of these three positions is, is advocated by one school of the four. Uh, now, everybody agrees this is not it. This is outside the permitted range. But somewhere in here is what God wants us to do. Uh, by about 1,000, Sunni jurisprudence realized that disagreement was permanent, that the Shafi'i were not really going to persuade the Hanafiya to give up their school and all become Shafi'is. <coughs> Uh, and they were by now accustomed to acknowledge th that their rules came from their feel for the probability of things, uh, not from certain knowledge of God's will. Uh, yeah, I've noticed it changes after 1000, although it would be easier to document. I admit if we had more legal works from before 1000, we don't. An additional reason for the fixing of four recognized schools of law that I've gone into a little is more or less official recognition by the caliph. Uh, in the early 11th century, he commissioned a epitome from each of the Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, and Hanbali schools. He didn't commission any epitome from the Vahari school, which was still active in that century in Baghdad. It shortly died out. 
Mm-hmm. There's also a certain relaxation in the way that jurists argue. Uh, I had a conversation with John McTessie, who was the son of my teacher, uh, dean of law school. And I related that I was bothered by the way that Mawardi, who was a Shafi jurist of the early 11th century, continually went beyond the Hadith based rules that I expected from a Shafi jurist. I mean, Shafi should say, we, the rule is thus and so because the Prophet said, kada wa kada. Uh, for example, the Hanafi school says that at the end of prayer, you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, as a recommended finish to the prayer, but they don't require it. It's still a valid prayer if you leave that out. Whereas the Shafi school says the first one, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, to the right is required, the second one to the left is what's merely recommended. Uh, and they've got, and first of all, Mawardi says, well, the Hadith says, Prophet did it this way, and the Hadith says the Prophet said this, and the Hanafis cite their Hadith, but it's, their interpretation of it is wrong. This I expect from a Shafi jurist. But then he goes on to say, and uh, the, the sacral, you enter the sacral state with words, Allah Akbar, therefore it's appropriate that you should end the sacral state with words, Assalamu Alaikum. Now, who said that ritual acts should be symmetrical? Uh, This is adducing an aesthetic criterion for which rule is better. Uh, Nothing in usul fix proposes aesthetic criteria of what's right and wrong. But Shafi goes on to say this. Well, what Magdusi said was, look, this is the way lawyers always argue. Uh, You throw down six reasons why your side should win. You don't care if three of those reasons seem pretty feeble, just so one of them hits the person who's reading it and uh, decides the case your way. Uh, so there's some of that. Uh, also, it has the effect of increasing the playfulness of legal argument. This is the kind of thing that makes law books fun to read. Uh, and incidentally, it also shows how, the, how loosely the literature of Faru al fiqh the literature of the actual rule, is related to the theory of the rules, al fiqh uh, well, why, I should explain, why multiple schools should have been fixed just now. Uh, one reason is surely, again, the cumulative effect of legal scholarship. Another was the re- need to strengthen the caliph and the Sunni community in opposition to the Shia. It seems to me also that the new style of school, where there's a regular curriculum and clearly identified teachers and students, was just more efficient at producing jurisprudence than the old style of collecting, collecting knowledge here and there. So since 1000 or so, uh, it has not been permitted to issue fatwas to give legal opinions unless one is uh, a recognized adherent of one of these schools. In theology then, okay. Now, I would like to say, yes, the Sunnis agreed to disagree over theology. Actually, no, I can't find any inclination to, uh, to leave alone disagreement in theology. Uh, and this is partly because theology is actually so important. Uh, now, there's a famous distinction between Judaism and Christianity, as one that religion of orthopraxy and the other religion of orthodoxy. In Judaism, the important thing is to do what's required. In Christianity, the important thing is to believe what's required. Uh, and I once thought of Islam as being on the Jewish side because Islamic law is so central to the Islamic tradition. Uh, but, okay, I remember reading a list from Saadia Gaon of things you could do to cease being a Jew. And they all have to do with ritual observances. You know, if you do things on the Sabbath that you shouldn't do or you fail to observe the uh, Yom Kippur, or something, then you cease to be a Jew. <coughs> Excuse me. But on the Islamic side, well, the Khawarij, the uh, Khawarijites had some idea like this. You could become an apostate by doing very bad things. But uh, the Sunni opinion was, no, nobody should be called an apostate for a sin. Only for wrong beliefs does one become an apostate. Uh, and as for which 
propositions that were necessary to believe. Well, the standard Sunni list pretty well prevailed for the end of the 10th century, so maybe there was, well, there was, dis there was agreement from this point. Uh, there was no longer serious debate over free will and predestination, for example, as there had been before. Uh, there was no longer any debate over whether faith can increase and decrease, which was a hot topic at the beginning of the ninth century. Uh, but this doesn't mean that there was no more conflict. Uh, the famous historian at Tabari, who wrote the book, as I mentioned earlier, on 20 readings of the Quran, ended his life shut into his house. Uh, the Hanabila were throwing rocks outside, and supposedly there was a big pile of rocks like this outside his door, and nobody could visit him, and he had to be buried in private because they couldn't have a public funeral. The Hanabila would have bothered him. And this was uh, probably for, well, there are different accounts of why, possibly because he had advocated wrong theological opinions. Uh, there was rioting in the 920s, in the decade after his death, over the interpretation of the Koran. There was, uh, in the later part of the century, conflict <coughs> shifted toward uh, Sunnis against Shi'is. But even in the next century, in the 11th century, uh, theology continued to excite argument. Uh, there were several famous riots in Baghdad in the later 11th century when uh, somebody would come to give a guest lecture on theology at the mosque, and he starts talking about Ash'ari theology, and the Hanabila are there, and they start throwing bricks. Uh, imagine mud bricks rather than fired bricks, but still uh, a lot of commotion. Or in the century after this, yes, I remember reading parallel biographical dictionaries by a Yemeni named Ibn Samr al-Ja'di and al-Yafi. Uh, they're both sh sh Shafi jurisprudence, but Ibn Samra, the Yemeni, was a traditionalist, and Yafi was an Ashari. So they would describe the same debate going on in Mecca and Medina, and Ibn Samra would say, so and so debated the innovators, meaning the heretics. And Yafi would say, and so and so debated the innovators, meaning the heretics, and they'd be talking about uh, opposite sides. So I can't say there is a prominent agreement to disagreement, agreement to disagree with regard to theology, as there were with regard to the text of the Quran and uh, which were the correct hadith and which were not, or which was the correct school of law. Uh, however, uh, there was a sort of agreement to disagree in that theology tended to be pushed out of the public sphere. Uh, first of all, it became normal to study Quran, law, and hadith in the mosque, later in something called a madrasa, which is a sort of special mosque just for a study. Uh, but theology and philosophy, like literature, was probably studied at the teacher's home, not in the public sphere. Uh, Maybe it was impossible for them to agree to disagree any more than this, just because theology was what defined one as a Muslim. If there were disagreements, at least they could be kept out of sight. Yeah. Well, going on to piety. Uh, uh, the last area of my research. Uh, Marshall Hodgson identified the principal distinguishing features of medieval Islamic civilization. These are the things that distinguished it from Chinese civilization, let's say, or South Asian or European. Uh, he said, uh, militarized politics, Islamic law, and Sufism. And certainly Islamic law and Sufism, I always tell students, you know, you want to study pre-modern Islam, work some on Islamic law, work some on Sufism, because those are sort of the two pillars. Those are the two main expressions of Islamic faithfulness yeah, before modern times. Uh, and I've been trying to historicize the uh, Sufism for a long time, that is to identify stages, uh, to identify when things uh, changed. An article of mine from the mid-90s tried to identify specifically where there occurred a often alleged transition from asceticism to mysticism. Uh, 
uh, I took a fairly precise definition of asceticism and mysticism. Asceticism here, what, what do I mean by that? I mean piety of obedience to God, a piety that has to do with recognizing God's transcendence and trying to impose God's will on the things of the world. As opposed to mysticism, a piety of communion with God, a piety of God's imminence, a piety of letting divinity come at you through the things of the world. Uh, now, asceticism is also commonly used of a program of physical austerity, but uh, that's one reason I've taken up the term renunciation for uh, early Muslim uh, uh, devotees. And mysticism is also sometimes used in a sort of normative sense, uh, in the sense of good, non-judgmental, uh, universalistic spirituality, or there have been attempts to distinguish between good mysticism and bad mysticism. And true mysticism is what's expressed in Christian terms, and false mysticism is what's expressed in any other terms. These other definitions of mysticism and asceticism I'm not interested in. I don't think they're useful. I mean, asceticism as austerity. Well, a mystic can practice austerity, too. Uh, at least someone who's interested in communion with God. Uh, well, if we look for stress and obedience as opposed to communion, then I think we can clearly identify a generational divide at the middle of the ninth century. Uh, Bishal Hafi, Mohasibi, I think I have named as examples of the last ascetics, the last people who talk as if God is above all to be obeyed, God is to be feared, as if they talk about love of God, but love of God for them is always our longing. It's never mutual. There's never back and forth and there's no there's no joining God this side of, uh, of the last judgment and on the other side as examples of people who are early mystics people who do seem to talk about communion with God and being close to God even here and now are the noon Kharraz and probably Sariya Sakhali now, the change ought to have been noticed by contemporary Muslims. If, if people went from talking about God one way to talking about God in another way, uh, we should not only find it in the record, we should find people talking about this change. And I think we do. Uh, most spectacularly, there's the Sufi Inquisition of Ghulam Khalil. Uh, he was a Basran preacher who came to Baghdad in the 870s, stirred up feeling against antinomian Sufis, who had said they did not fear God. Uh, this is a common place on the mystical side. You get it in the Gospel of John, where Jesus tells the disciples, uh, you are not to fear, you are not servants, but friends. Uh, these, uh, these Sufis seem to have had some, well, s expressed themselves in a similar way. And Ghulam Khalil was very upset, got some other people upset. He worked through the Shadow Caliph's mother. He got the authorities to res arrest a number of Sufis and put them on trial for heresy. Uh, it seems they were acquitted, but some were sufficiently scared to leave Baghdad for a number of years. And Janaid, who is the most famous and important early Baghdadi Sufi, uh, he got out of trouble by denying that he was a Sufi at all. He said, I'm, I'm not with these guys. I'm studying law. I'm uh, a student of Abu Thawr. Uh, so Junaid went on, I believe, to develop a new way of describing mystical experience that would not be so dangerously offensive to people like Ghulam Khalil. Uh, in the Sufi tradition, there are many famous triads, such as Baqa, Fanat, Baqa, meaning enduring, disappearance, endurance. Endurance is what we're all doing here. We're aware of time passing. Uh, we are very aware of our materiality. Fana in the middle, annihilation, that's when the mystic loses all sense of himself. Uh, he disappears in God. He has no, no more consciousness of his own will. He has only God's will. And then he falls out of ecstasy, and then it's baqa again, it's endurance again, but it's a transformed endurance. They, call about, they, they talk about the second enduring. Uh, there's another one, sah and sukr and sah. Uh, sah is sobriety, sukr is drunkenness, and then there's the second sobriety after 
this period of drunkenness. Or there's separation, union, separation. One is aware of separation from God, and then one is un unified with God, and then one is separated again. Well, it's a lot, it's, I think it was, re it was in order to reassure the ascetics, I think, that Junaid started talking about these uh, new transformed uh, kinds of endurance and uh, sobriety and so on. Now, Nuri was a contemporary of Junaid who fled Baghdad at the Inquisition. He spoke of separation and union, not separation, union, separation. And he was mystified by Junaid's new terminology, this touching story that some of Junaid's disciples once saw somebody in Baghdad and said, oh, isn't that a Nuri? And they go up to him and find out, yes, this is Nuri, the guy who was around 15 years ago and then disappeared at this Inquisition. He tell me, oh, you've got to come to the come to the mosque, such and such mosque, where Junaid will have his circle tomorrow, talk to the group. So they got him to come. And they started asking Junaid questions, and he would answer them. And then they said, well, what do you say, Nuri? And he, he said, well, you know, you guys are talking about union. You're not talking about separation. He didn't have this new lingo of uh, the second separation. And the disciples complained about this guy who seemed so witless. And Janaid said, oh, have pity on him. Maybe he's old man after all. <clears throat> well, that was the old style mystic who spoke recklessly as opposed to the new style mystic who spoke very carefully. Uh, so why did the transition take place at this time? Again, I say c cumulative changes are, uh, seem compelling. Uh, the old renunciant stress on narrowing down one's concerns so that one had nothing in mind except God uh, seems to have in time led to thinking only of God, being conscious of nothing but God. Hence an ecstatic experience of union with God. Uh, secondarily, it seems to me that uh, it's important that there develop regular means for supporting mystics at about the later 9th century, which is just when Janite is active. Especially these would be foundations that people would set up. Uh, property would be de dedicated uh, to the support of religious people. Uh, proceeds from these foundations would then be given them as stipends. And you can't, have, you can't have somebody spending days in contemplation without somebody else working to feed him. And this happens from the later 9th century. Also, uh, observed how politics in this period was increasingly apparently taken over, taken away from local notables, put in the hands of uh, Turkish soldiers who made government seem more arbitrary and action in the world less satisfying. And the turn toward inmer inmerness was reinforced when Sufism got out to Khorasan, which is in northeastern Iran and southern Uzbekistan, I suppose. Uh, which is another subject of my research. There it got mixed up with a local malamity tendency, which was already in rivalry with, with the local Karami tendency. And the Karamiya, they, they were outward and demonstrative, and the Malamatiya were inward and non-demonstrative. And Sufism agreed with them, with its stress on uh, external decorum and sobriety. Uh, let me skip some of my earlier work. I should say, er, work in an earlier period. Uh, conclusion. So in all these areas, I'd say, Quran, Hadith, law, theology, piety, piety some mechanism was worked out across the 10th century, into the t across the 9th century into the 10th, to manage disagreement. Uh, some modus vivendi was worked out so that uh, different Sunni Muslims could get along with mutual respect. Uh, there's been a strong counter tendency in the past century. Uh, there's anxiety about the Quranic text, as there, I think, wasn't before. Uh, people deny the variety that the medieval tradition acknowledged. Uh, the impeccability of Bukhari and Muslim have been asserted more emphatically than ever. Uh, the quali quantities of hadith that were considered worth considering before are disparaged as weak today. Uh, 
people called uh, Salafists, Salafia, try to go back behind the schools of law. They, they dislike having four schools on every question. They want to go back and say, what did the prophet uh, teach on this, in the La Methab line? Uh, Sufism, then, is widely rejected as manufacturing obligations. Uh, you know, God, God tells us to do this and this and this. Who are you to lay on extra ceremonies? Uh, but it seems to me in, in the way that the Sunni community formed around these agreements to disagree, there should, be, uh, there should be material here for Muslims to become less anxious about all these points. Uh, and what is more, uh, become less anxious about the pluralistic implications of so many modern changes in transportation, communication, economic organization. Oh, I look over recent textbooks in the field with some complacency. Uh, my work has had its effect. Uh, in insisting on historical change gen generally, for example, and in particular insisting on tension between rationalism and traditionalism and identifying major tr turning points. Uh, in the field of modern Islamic studies, that is, the study of Islam today, I do see a danger of anti-anti-communism. Uh, you know, people, people back in the 50s and 60s who are understandably upset by what some of the anti-communists said. And so they, they were less than honest about how bad the communist system really was. Uh, they asked for a relentlessly anodyne tone. Uh, numerous phenomena are brushed aside as being unhelpful to talk about for the sake of damping down aggressive impulses toward Muslims in Europe and North America and in Muslim-majority countries. Uh, well. Yes, aggression should be damped down, but uh, there are other ways of doing it, and uh, really it shouldn't affect our sense of historical probability. It should certainly not restrict what we consider worth investigating. Uh, I, I really, it's, it's a very high value among scholars that uh, they investigate uh, whatever they want. They follow the evidence wherever it leads. And our idea of what it's legitimate to study and what probably happened in the past should not be affected by what seems to be politically convenient today. Uh, but insisting on historical change, insisting that the Islamic tradition was not uniquely resistant to change over time, to back projection or idealization, uh, must inevitably cause some discomfort to believers, but that's not not the whole story. I hope also that believers can take some comfort in this story of change and accommodation in thinking that uh, whatever anybody doesn't like about uh, Islam today, it's going to be different in 50 years uh, because everything changes over time. Thank you. <laughs>